the world can be a hostile place, and we need ways to defend ourselves from existential threats. And I'm not talking about the traffic on the way here today, although I got to say it was frightening. But the trip was worth it, so we could see up close an example of a highly sophisticated defense system that, uh, while it might not protect us from ornery drivers, is effective just about everywhere else. There's biology. Okay, Owen, what would this guy do if he got caught in a sticky situation? Well, obviously he uses those incredibly big claws, which can draw blood, and uh, he's got a stinger that's full of venom. He is well set to defend himself. We are not the only ones cozying up to venomous animals, although I'm not sure I'm ready to cozy up exactly. I'm Molly Bentley. And I'm Seth Shostak. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, we go where few people want to tread, to the domain of those scientists who are asking a lot of questions about venom from how it evolved, what makes it such a potent bioweapon, and how it might be synthesized to make life-saving drugs. It's Venom Diagram. Hi, this is Owen Merricks. I co-own the East Bay Vivarium in Berkeley, California. And can you introduce this creature to us? This is an Asian forest scorpion. These are not naturally docile animals, but we have found that if we work with them and tame them, they turn out to be quite lovely creatures too. But he has his stinger sort of poised up there, facing forward. Facing you, I think. Yeah, well, it could, I think it's you actually, Molly. But, I mean, is that, a, you know, sort of an offensive gesture? Hey, back off, man. No, that's, that's resting position. That would be no different than him looking up at you saying, well, he's got those teeth ready to go for me just because you're smiling. <laughs> Now, when you look at this creature here, this scorpion, describe what he or she looks like, because it's a remarkable ebony, a shiny ebony from head to toe, large, the size of your palm. To me, uh, the two creatures on this planet I most respect in a kind of an engineering sense are scorpions and sharks. They are just beautifully, beautifully designed creatures. They are perfect animals. The scorpion is set up with the large claws, which by the way, are not like your hands. They're actually the outer part of the scorpion's mouth, so that makes them like your lips. They sort of look like lobster claws. Well, Everyone says that, is that not right? That, that is absolutely correct. Same thing is true on lobsters. And they are relatives, not close relatives, but they are relatives. The color that you mentioned is fantastic. If you catch it in the right light, you'll notice that there's a greenish sheen to it. That color has a very specific name. It's called corbeau. Corbeau is a French word that also means raven. And scorpions and, and ravens are the two animals that have this unique green-black color. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's just stunningly beautiful. Okay, venomous usually means to stay away. Most people get that message. Owen Merricks is not one of those people. He's become friends with these animals, and so has this guy. My name is Justin Schmidt. I'm an entomologist at the Southwestern Biological Institute of the University of Arizona. Venom comes in many different packages. Sometimes it's uh, long, serpentine, and scaly, like that guy over in that cage there. Uh, but sometimes that package is tinier and still packs a punch. Sometimes it's even airborne. Most of us know to get away from stinging insects. Somewhere inside of him, Justin Schmidt does too. Now he swears that he doesn't encourage insects to sting him. It's a hazard of the job. Basically, I'm kind of a researcher and what I was trying to understand is why they have these stings, what good they are for the insect. I'm trying to get myself into the head of the insect. And yet, at the very least, this guy's not getting the message that these irritable insects are trying to impart, namely, stay away. Because Dr. Schmidt keeps coming back. He now has the uh, dubious honor of having more than 80 different insects that have stung him. He's gotten the pointy end of the stinger so many times, he's actually developed an eponymous pain index with his colleagues. The Schmidt pain index runs from one to four. One is the least painful, four is the thing most of us never want to experience. Okay, well, just to set this up, every index needs a, a, a kind of a calibration point. It's just a reference point 
that allows you to anchor the whole scale, it turns out that the most common stinging insect also delivers an average dose of pain. And that insect is the honeybee. You know, just about everybody as a kid has been running across the lawn and stepped on a clover with a honeybee, and they say, ow! You know, they know what that is. So that's the two, that's what we anchor it to. By contrast, the sting of a fire ant has a pain scale rating of one. It's kind of like a static shock here, walking across the carpet in the middle of the winter and a touch a light switch and get the zap onto your finger. Now, taking the Schmidt pain index to its max, a four, well, meet the tarantula hawk, which, despite its name, is not a bird. It's a very large wasp. And wherever you find tarantulas, you may find these guys. And if you want to know what its sting is like... Yeah, you, you don't want to know, actually, but it turns out the tarantula hawk wasp is this huge, beautiful, almost hummingbird-sized thing, iridescent blue, purple, and with orange wings. And that feels kind of, in the electrical analogy, like you're walking underneath a, a high-powered electric line, and the wind snaps it off, and you get 20,000 volts. It just lands on your shoulder, and wow! You know, it just absolutely flattens you. And I, I tell people, lay down and scream, which you know, isn't the kind of thing you typically expect out of a stuffy old scientist. Why not? Feels good. By the time you're done screaming, it's pretty much the pain's gone. That's the good part of that sting. Okay, so it doesn't last for days at a time. I mean, it's, it's a minute's uh, experience kind of thing? Yeah, it's about two or three minutes, and it's kind of a disappointment, actually, because, you know, you've gone through all this horrendous pain. It's just absolutely excruciating. And then you want to have some kind of badge of, you know, honor and valor for, you know, enduring this and surviving that. And you look at your finger or your arm, wherever you got stung, it's usually on a finger. You're trying to grab the thing, which is a bad idea. And you look at your finger and you'll see a little tiny speck of pepper that sized uh, blood spot with an actual stinger went in you. And that's all you'll see. There'll be no white wheel or no red flare or no swelling or no itching, you know, nothing to to show your valor. Uh, yeah. Does it do this with the stinger the way honeybees do? Does it have a sharp thing at the, the back end? Yeah, it's at the very end. It's actually uh, the egg laying tube, the ovipositor, and it got modified so that rather than just laying eggs, it now secretes venom. And so it's this tube that is like a hypodermic needle that it jabs into you out the rear end of the wasp. And it's actually quite sharp and very stout. You know, if you kind of imagine a tarantula is a pretty tough, rubbery thing. It's kind of like a tennis ball with six legs. you got to be able to poke through that with this stinger, so it's quite sharp and quite stout for getting in. And that means that it'll get through your nice, soft, ping-pong ball textured skin rather than uh, you know something really tough. You mentioned tarantulas. That is the uh, intended prey of this stinging apparatus. Exactly. It's actually designed to paralyze them. And, and it's a, kind of an interesting story because it actually doesn't eat the tarantula itself. It just sips nectar from flowers as the adult. But it needs to have a protein diet for the young. So it catches the tarantula, paralyzes it, puts it in a cell, and then lays an egg on it. And the egg then turns into a young larva, which sips the blood and the fat and the reproductive system and you know, the digestive says all these things that we don't need, you know, maybe we like them, but we don't really need them for life support. And then it goes on this gluttonous rampage in the last day and eats all the nervous system, the brain, so to speak, and the heart and all. And then it sits back and gives a big burp or so to speak and, and pupates to become an adult. You've been stung, I've read, by 83 different insects. You, you must have a loving cup on the mantle there if you have a mantle in Arizona. This isn't by accident. They weren't all accidental stings, were they? I mean, you're trying to learn something here by being stung. It's not to win awards. No, well, most of them actually were accidental. And I use the word accidental because if I'm out in somewhere in the middle of Australia, say, and I see a, a bulldog ant colony, which I've never seen before, and I only have a limited time to be there, by darned, I'm going to get them, and I need you know, hundreds of them usually because I'm doing venom chemistry and I need quantities. When the process of being enthusiastic, you trade off some of the, if you're really protective, then you're slow and you don't get very many. So if you throw caution a little bit into the wind and then go and get your sample that you need, 
Well, then you usually get stung. And so you say, gosh, you know, I've got a prediction here. I've got a theory. I've got to get some answers. And the only way you can do it is you can say, well, darn it, I'm going to bite the bullet and grab this thing and make it sting me. And I've done that with mud dauber wasps. You often see these. They make little mud walls and outbuildings and such. And also with cicada killers, which are great, big, wonderful, spectacular wasps. Look like a yellow jacket on steroids. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I have to say that this discussion is maybe turning me off to a second career in entomology. Uh, you know, o- almost any career has its downside, but this is particularly specific downside. What about the memory of pain? I mean, not just you know, the, in the case of the tarantulas, but in general, uh, do obviously we remember pain and we try to avoid whatever caused pain in the future. But is that a common characteristic? Because, you know, I've I've seen statements to the effect that a goldfish only has a memory of three seconds or, you know, stuff like that. I mean, is the memory of pain a useful thing? Oh, absolutely. I, I think we kind of short shrift uh, a lot of other animals and assume they're a lot less intelligent or less able than they probably really are. That you know, uh, most animals will learn, for example, on nasty tasting things. You know, predators, even even other insects, will quickly learn that, oh, this thing is really unpleasant. And they, they retain that memory for a long time. In insect case, usually two or three days. In case of things like lizards, which are, are vertebrates, they're a little higher up on the evolutionary scale in, in most regards. They'll often remember it basically for lifetime, and birds can be the same way. Okay, so it's really an effective defense because uh, it, it, it will protect that, that stinging creature well into the future, maybe forever, right? Oh, exactly, and, and the other benefit is you think of the poor stinging creature. You know, what's its future? Its future is, of course, just like ours, our children, and it, it's young. And if it can teach this predator, say this bird that maybe lives four or five years, and if it learns from mama, mama wasp, that, you know, oh, this this is bad news, well, then when junior wasps come along or the grandchildren or so on, during that life of that bird, it's going to say, oh, that looks just like that other thing, that thing that was the mother, and they'll leave them alone. So she's actually conferring protection on her, her subsequent generations, too. <laughs> Did you ever get a sting in your career where you thought maybe you'd you'd gone too far, that maybe this was it, you know, I really did it this time? Uh, not really. I guess the closest I've been to that is I was doing a, a separate experiment on decision-making in honeybees. In other words, a honeybee, when it stings you, it dies because it loses its sting in you and eviscerates itself. So you can imagine, you know, you're not going to live very long with your innards are all ripped out of you. And so I was asking, do the bees just willy-nilly commit suicide to defend their colony, or do they actually evaluate information? And in the process of doing that, I had to count how many would try to sting me. And I was at one particularly obnoxious colony of these were Africanized bees, and I was swinging the net, catching them for two and a half hours. And I was about ready to collapse and end up, you know, half dead because I was you know, heat exhaustion or something of that sort. It was in the late spring, and it was pretty hot. And I was, you know, just kind of exhausted, and I'd gotten 9,000 bees at that point. And they, they almost got me because they just wore me out. But finally, I got the last one and managed to survive. So that's about the most harrowing experience I've had. Yeah, I like astronomy. The stars don't come after you. Well, just to get the bigger picture here, Justin... This venomous capability, the the ability to sting, has had a kind of an interesting evolutionary benefit for insects in that it allows them to get together in uh, big colonies, you know, have uh, social insects. Maybe you could explain how that comes about. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the reasons I was studying these in the first place was I wanted to say, well, we've got social insects that have very large colonies, things like honeybees or yellow jacket wasps or hornets or some big ant colonies. And we all know the theoretical advantages of that and there's the mathematics of how they would get there genetically is pretty much worked out. And I was asking the question, well, how do they get there, you know, when the rubber meets the road? You know, how do they actually get there? And the 
the problem they have is that if if you imagine, you know, say you're in a party and there's one peanut in a bowl across the room, you're not going to bother to waste your time going over to eat one peanut. But if there's a whole bowl of peanuts over there, then it's worth your effort to go to some, you know, hassle and walk over and, and get them. The same kind of analogy works for stinging insects, that if you're just one scrawny little wasp or, or bee or something like that, yeah, it's not worth my effort as a as a big lizard or a mammal. You know, something you can think of like a raccoon or a skunk. Why is it going to want to bother for one little tiny insect? But then you give it a whole nest like the yellow jackets where they have thousands of them. Oh boy, you know, that's a real dinner. And so that's worth trying to overcome their defenses and eat them. And so what you're having is an arms race going on, a, a predator-prey arms race where the predator is trying to... Uh, get a bigger and bigger meal, and the prey is trying to prevent being a, a bigger meal. And the way that arms race goes is that the stings get more effective. They hurt more, and they're more toxic, do more damage as your colony, your species size increases. And the predators get more and more resistant and new tricks to figure out how to defeat them. So this is an ongoing arms race to this day. Justin Schmidt, thanks so very much for speaking with us. It's been my pleasure, thank you. Justin Schmidt is an entomologist at the Southwestern Biological Institute at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, and he is the author of The Sting of the Wild, the story of the man who got stung for science. You know, it's kind of interesting to hear about a guy who's trying to see the world from the insect's point of view and, uh, you know, why it needs a stinger to protect itself. Well, we've been moseying around the East Bay Vivarium with Owen Merricks, who is showing us a menagerie of venomous animals. Okay, you just pulled out of that box a tarantula. They jump, right? <laughs> uh, some spiders jump. Tarantulas don't tend to jump. Now, what does she feel like in your in your hands? Is it prickly or fuzzy? Because she obviously she has... is she is velvety. Okay, so if she were to defend herself, mm -hmm. how would she do it? Which end? I guess which end is the front end? Which is the back? And if, which end bites? If you scared her, she would rear up her front half. You're picking her up. Oh goodness. Fangs. She would show you her fangs. She might even drip venom off the fangs. But in fact, it's really, really, really hard to scare her. So she's just a very taciturn, sweet animal. Most tarantulas are. And you know, I've seen tarantulas come out of bananas at the supermarket occasionally. Oh, come on, you have not here? Yeah, 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 here, here. Yeah, just down the street from where I live. And I thought, well, okay, it's probably pretty harmless. I mean, he, he came all this way. Uh, should I have been scared of the tarantula? Apparently not. Most tarantulas are, if anything, just terrified of you. You know, if you don't know what the species is and don't know what the temperament of that particular animal happens to be like, best to leave it alone. But in fact, the idea of tarantulas being aggressive is a movie lie. That's just not true. So, so what does this tarantula normally eat? They eat insects. They eat small mammals if they can get basically anything they can hold down. So lizards, small mammals, small birds. Well, hang on, Owen. We want to talk with you a bit more. Next, venoms can be potent, but sometimes one animal's poison is another's cure. One of the most exciting fields in pharmaceutical science is the study of venoms and their potential to become therapeutics. It's Venom Diagram from Big Picture Science. Ranked as the number one public university nationally for its commitment to undergraduate teaching, Miami University is one of the original eight public Ivies, and it's located in the picturesque college town of Oxford, Ohio, also cited as the number one college town by Forbes magazine. The four-year graduation rate for students at Miami is among the top 20 of publics in the nation. Learn more at miamioh.edu slash public ivy. We're here at the East Bay Vivarium with co-owner Owen Merricks. Okay, Owen, maybe you could tell me what he is. Well, this is a beaded lizard. This is one of two venomous lizards in the world. Uh, it's the one which we work with here at the Vivarium and breed. They're 
very lovely creatures. He's gorgeous. Um, now, should I stay away she. from? She is gorgeous. <laughs> she is gorgeous. Now, should I stay away from her? Her tongue? Uh, her tongue is absolutely safe. Her mouth is not. They are venomous. They're one of two venomous lizards in the world. The other being the Gila monster, which is her more famous cousin. The first thing I would point out to you is venomous does not necessarily mean dangerous on two levels. First of all, most venomous animals are harmless to humans. Just because something has venom doesn't mean it's particularly strong or that it's going to use it. In the case of the beaded lizard, the venom is quite powerful. Uh, not lethal, but powerful nonetheless. In the case of this particular one, the reason she's not dangerous is because she's absolutely tame and has no reason to bite me and won't do it. If she were to bite you, though, would you would you feel it? You'd feel something, even if it... <laughs> I'd feel a lot. It would be really, really painful. I have been bitten by one once. It was just a glancing bite. Felt like my finger was on fire. Bled profusely and my finger swelled up and all the kind of things you would expect from any kind of mildly venomous bite. She's just lovely. Can you describe her? Beaded lizard is a very accurate name. Her scales are all rounded and quite protuberant. So she has the effect of being like a beaded purse. Can one of us touch her sure. skin? Are you going to do it? Okay. I, of course. Well, it's just as he describes. I mean, it's nice and bumpy and it is like a beaded purse, uh, except it's wiggling. How did you get into this and, and, and what fuels your fascination with these animals? I have a natural inclination for animals in general and have since I was a baby. But I have always also had an interest in otherworldly things, unusual things, and I've always had a soft spot for the underdog. So reptiles and amphibians naturally drew me. The undersnake <laughs> instead of the underdog. <laughs> oh, there you go. Venoms are potent biococktails. Honed over millions of years of evolution, they have behind them the ultimate R&D. So scientists are taking advantage of some critters' offensive weaponry to help us defend against disease. A biologist at the University of Hawaii, Christy Wilcox's specialty is venomous animals. And in her book, Venomous, How Earth's Deadliest Creatures Mastered Biochemistry, Dr. Wilcox describes exactly how venom kills, or at least renders its victim helpless, and which animals in the world are the most deadly. She also explains why one of the most exciting areas of biological research is turning venom into, in some cases, life-saving therapeutics. Well, we have to tell you, this is a story of snake oil, real snake oil that works. The first and sort of classic example is Captopril, which those of you out there with hypertension might know as a common pharmaceutical. It's a blockbuster billion dollar drug to treat high blood pressure, and it came from a viper in Brazil. And the reason that they discovered it is because the viper was known when it bit people to cause steep drops in blood pressure. And scientists were then able to figure out which component of the venom actually caused that drop in blood pressure, and then they were able to modulate it, put it in a pill, basically, and make it so that people can take it to lower their blood pressure safely. Well, I guess the vipers weren't really interested in lowering people's <laughs> blood pressure, except that insofar as that might get them a meal. What, what was their intention with right. this stuff? Right. So what the vipers are trying to do with this stuff is that if you have a sudden drop in blood pressure in, let's say, a much smaller mammal than us, that could cause it to not get enough blood to the brain and pass out, which is a really nice, easy way to capture a prey item. I see. Okay. So what we're doing is we're taking advantage of uh, this uh, critter's offensive weapons to use them to uh, help us in the defense against uh, hypertension. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's true of a lot of venoms. The thing that's really special and interesting about venoms is that we know they have potent activities in our bodies. We know that they do things to us. And that's exactly what you're looking for with a pharmaceutical. You want something that modulates some system in your body that's going wrong. And so we can look at things like venoms and say, well, we know that this one drops blood pressure. Maybe there's a blood pressure medication in it. Or this one causes blood to stop clotting. Maybe there's an anticoagulant we can use for surgeries or for people who have clotting disorders. Really interesting. So what's your definition of a venom? I mean, you know, I, I had this naive view of fangs sticking out of a snake's mouth, but <laughs> what, what, what is a venom that, if, you, if you have to define that's it? That's not actually that bad a definition, really. So the the thing that sets venoms apart from poisons and other toxins is the route of delivery. 
So a venom is just any toxin or toxic cocktail that is actively <laughs> introduced into your body, a.k.a. through some kind of wound. So something like fangs biting you or spines stabbing you, something that actively creates a hole in you, <laughs> however small. I mean, we think of things like the stinging cells of jellies, and those have teeny tiny micron-sized tubules, but they're still creating a wound. They're still actively injecting a venom into you, so do, they are do, venomous. Do, do mosquitoes inject anything into you? I know they take something out, but... Uh... Yes, so mosquitoes, at least in the encompassing definition of venom, are indeed venomous because when they bite you, they inject anticoagulants to keep your blood flowing. They inject painkillers and anti-inflammatory sort of drugs to try to make sure that you don't notice they're there while they're feeding. And so all of that chemical cocktail that they use to hide the fact that they're sucking your blood is a venom. You know, if asked to name animals that use venom, I suspect that most folks would come up with no more than a handful, but the use of venom as a way of getting dinner or whatever, that, that's pretty common out there, isn't it? It's remarkably widespread. I mean, almost every branch of life you can think of has some venomous representatives. When you've got, from the beginning of life, you've got the cnidarians, the entire phylum that includes jellies, anemones, corals, all of them are venomous. And then you can go up, you can get to things like the arthropods. You've got so many venomous insects. You've got venomous sea urchins. You've got venomous sea stars. You've got venomous amphibians, venomous reptiles, obviously, even venomous mammals. There's even a venomous primate. Well, how does venom really work? It's not like eating a bad piece of meat, which, you know, has bacteria that get into your body and cause sickness and you might die. But venom doesn't work that way. How, do, how does it work? So most venoms are comprised of small or large proteins. And these are the molecules that your body can create really readily that DNA encodes for, right? And so the way that it works, it really depends on the venom. But there are sort of two, maybe three, depending on who you ask, main categories. The first category is neurotoxins. So neurotoxic venoms attack your nerves, which means they attack your muscles largely, but also things like pain signaling and thinking, you know, all of those things in our bodies that are connected by our nervous system. And those ones largely become dangerous because they cause paralysis. You, you have stop that, breathing or something? You stop breathing or your heart can even stop beating. So these are muscles that we need to survive. And so when we have a neurotoxic venom that causes paralysis, it can cause death very quickly. The other sort of category are hemotoxic venoms, and those are ones that are targeting our blood. So they do things like cause large drops or increases in blood pressure, modulate heart rate so that your heart beats really fast or really slow, things like that, clotting as well. The whole clotting cascade is a major target of many venoms, either causing blood to clot too fast or causing it to never clot so that you just keep bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. Wow. Well, I think everybody has seen the cowboys in the movies, uh, you know, being bit by rattlers. I I is that a bad way to go? From what I know of rattlesnake venom, it's certainly not a way I'd like to go. Uh, rattlesnake venom, as a viper venom, tends to be very hemotoxic and tends to be this sort of third category, which kind of falls under hemotoxic, which is cytotoxic, and it destroys tissue. So rattlesnakes can cause pretty nasty tissue damage, and you can die from things like failure of your kidneys because there's just so much crap getting into your blood from dying flesh, and that is that is not a pleasant way to die. <laughs> How did venom evolve in the first place? I mean, you know, these are pretty sophisticated compounds that make up a venom, you say the proteins and so forth and so on, I mean, can just hardly imagine here, here's some sort of critter that today is totally non-venomous and tomorrow is, uh, you know, how, how did that come about? Well, the, the sort of main driving mechanism by which venom evolves is gene duplication. So what happens is the animal's DNA replicating machinery makes a mistake and accidentally makes an extra copy of something. And if that gene happens to be something that for example, let's say it's something that regulates their nerves, something that is a, a nervous system regulator. Then as that animal continues to have babies and those babies continue to have babies, right, over time, that second copy, since it's not necessary for the function, the original function is still being maintained by that original gene. Since it's not necessary for function, it can accumulate mutations and change. And then sometimes 
by chance, it happens to do something else or do something useful. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, people were using boiling oil in their kitchens to make French fries or whatever, and uh, then they found that it was good for defense, too. I don't know. It was just sort of <laughs> an ancillary use for something that was made accidentally. Right. So the idea that having an extra copy of a gene allows them to use it in a new way and use that protein or that protein family in a new way. And so if something were already in your saliva, right, and it's a digestive enzyme or something, and then you get an extra copy of it, so then you have this extra stuff in your saliva, and it changes just enough that it happens to cause a drop in blood pressure or do something useful, that animal then has a better odds of catching prey, and he survives a little better than the other guys in his species, and so his genes get passed on to more of the offspring and more and more and more in each generation, and suddenly you have an entire lineage that has this new enzyme in it. I was surprised to read that snails are of interest to someone like you. Uh, which snails are toxic? I, I assume they produce a slow-acting poison, but maybe that's <laughs> just to make a joke. I don't know. Uh, so there are venomous snails. There's quite a few of them. The, the most dangerous group of them are what we call cone snails, and they're called that because they have a cone-like shape. And these animals can range in being sort of mild to painful to deadly in five minutes or less. The big one, Conus geographus, which is the geographer's cone, can kill a person very quickly if their venom gets injected into you. But, but, but what are they going after? I mean, <laughs> what, what do snails need venom for? So these snails are, the most dangerous ones to us anyway, are the ones that are fish hunters. And so they are killing these very fast moving prey. And the reason they're dangerous to us is that they, of course, largely kill by paralysis. So again, you have the problem of neurotoxins getting into your system and stopping you from breathing a little too quickly. Oh, okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Venom can obviously be offensive in every sense, but it's also, you know, capable of defense. You've mentioned that. Offensive is fast and fatal, but defensive can be, what, slow and non-fatal, just serves as a warning, right? I mean, it's just to get you out of their territory. Yeah, so defensive venoms, the main sort of convergent trait is that they induce agony. And it makes sense if you're trying to defend yourself with a venom that you would want to produce a whole lot of pain. Because pain is something that us predators <laughs> have a very strong reaction to. And so the second that you get stung by, say, a lionfish trying to defend itself, you start feeling intense pain and you go, okay, no, nope, nope, not eating that. Done, done, go away. <laughs> right? And they don't need to kill you. Now, there are defensive venoms that can be fatal, but ultimately their goal when defending themselves is to get you to stop eating them very, very quickly. Well, I have to ask this question. Of, of all these venomous animals, and there just are so many, uh, which is the most deadly? I, I'm, I'm not sure how you'd even know, but w what would you say? So that's always an interesting question to answer because it really depends on how you define deadly. I mean, are you talking deadly per drop? And that becomes also a loaded question even in and of itself because you have to ask, well, how are you measuring it? Because generally speaking, we don't take venoms, inject them into people and find how deadly they are. We use surrogates like mice, for example, and we say, oh, well, if this amount of venom kills 50% of this handful of mice, then it's this toxic. And, and we call that an LD50 value. LD50, I take it that's lethal dose for 50% of the population. Yep. Um, and so... By those standards, I mean, there are some snakes, there's box jellies, a few species that are really deadly. But you look at something like the cone snail, for example, that I talked about, that animal would rank really high on the deadly per drop. But nobody gets stung pretty much every year by these cone snails. I mean, maybe one or two people. So they're not killing a whole lot of people. Christy Wilcox, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Christy Wilcox is a biologist at the University of Hawaii studying venomous animals, and she is the author of Venomous, How Earth's Deadliest Creatures Mastered Biochemistry. Now, you, you have a lizard there, but Owen, what about a creature like this? I wonder if your powers of description could come into play with what I see before me. This is an albino Burmese python. She's about uh, 14 feet long. She is 
medium sized by Burmese Python standards. Medium sized. Yes. So the center of her body is as thick as a uh, somebody who works out a lot's uh, thigh. Now, pythons are not venomous, but they do okay even without venom by crushing their prey to death. And pythons are a trendy programming language too. <laughs> she is slow and purposeful, very, very sweet, very nice animal. Oh, there she's moving just a little bit there. Yep, yep. she's going into her, her hide space. Okay, as I'm talking to you, there's a lot of noise behind me in this cage. That's our that's our water monitor, and, and he likes to burrow around and, and go across his cage quite a bit. Okay, so. so if he's a monitor, I shouldn't be surprised that he's watching me. Right. <laughs> They're just kind of scaled up <laughs> literally, uh, lizards are the kind that you think of when you think of a lizard, right? Mm -hmm. These are just big guys. The monitor's a lot smaller than that python down there, and so I'm thinking that the python has to eat a lot more poundage per day to keep going. But on the other hand, the, the snake isn't doing a whole lot of moving around, whereas the monitor is. It seems like the metabolic rate for that monitor is a lot higher than a snake. That's, that's a funny description since the monitor is not exactly zipping around his cage, but I guess compared to the python, he oh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's definitely a sprinter compared to that python. That python kind of oozes, you know, like a, a half an inch a second, but that monitor walks from one side of the cage to the other in five seconds. So. Well, here at the vivarium, we specialize in monitors. You're right, their metabolism is super high by reptile standards. And that is because it's one of the few reptiles that actually hunts. Most reptiles, including the Burmese python, sit and wait. When things walk by, they snatch them. Monitors hunt. In my opinion, hunting is one of the factors that leads to intelligence. So monitors are very bright animals uh, by reptile standards. and really interesting animals to work with. My favorites, actually. Owen Merrick, thank you so much for speaking to us and sharing with us your animals here at the East Bay Vivarium. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Coming up, synthesizing key compounds in venom is helping us develop important drugs, but the drug we urgently need is that which will fight what the United Nations calls the number one threat to modern medicine. The threat of antibiotic resistance and how a new generation of drugs may come from the quietest members of the biosphere. And I'm not talking about that snake over there. It's Venom Diagram from Big Picture Science. Hey, want to join me next summer for a one-week tour of southern France, including this spectacular Pic de Midi Observatory high in the Pyrenees. This is quite an expedition, including Paleolithic caves, spectacular cathedrals, and of course, the very best food. And you can ask me all those embarrassing questions that have been percolating in your mind for years. Find out more. Go to melitatrips.com. That's Melita, M-E-L-I-T-A, trips.com and uh, au revoir. Well, we heard how venom, like that in that beautiful lizard over there, evolved and what effective weaponry it really is and that there may be a whole zoo of medicines that could come from the animal world. But there is one basic category of drugs that we cannot do without, but which is becoming frighteningly non-effective. Antibiotics are no longer the sure shot that they once were in fighting bacterial infection. We heard earlier in the show about the ongoing arms race between predators and prey in the evolution of venom. In a venom diagram, the, the venom is a subset of toxins. All venom is a toxin, but not all toxins are venoms. Bacteria can produce lethal toxins, and their ability to evolve to resist antibiotics has created another evolutionary arms race, one that's unfolding in real time. In a recent meeting of the United Nations in New York City, its first General Assembly meeting on drug-resistant bacteria, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said that the antimicrobial resistance is a fundamental threat to global health and safety. So scientists are searching for new sources of antibiotics, and one important source may come from the quietest members of our biosphere, members that don't hiss, sting, or snap. Let's go look for some green stuff here, besides the green sheen of some of these reptiles. Here's some greenery, some plants. Remember, our first antibiotic penicillin? Well, that was found in a petri dish of bacteria-killing bread mold by Alexander Fleming quite a while ago. 
Cassandra Quave is looking for new antibiotics in plants. She's an ethnobotanist and assistant professor of dermatology at Emory University in Atlanta. So plants are a great source of potential medicines because they can't get up and move away from from harm. So they rely on this very complex chemical language and a complex um, chemical arsenal to both defend themselves against um, threats in their environment or to attract pollinators. So because plants have to stay in one place, they can't swim or fly or run away. Uh, They need a defense system that is particularly potent or exacting. Yes. Well, let's take a case in point. One of the plants that you are looking at, and you've looked at many, the Italian blackberry. Now, when I hear this, I'm thinking pies, (laughs) marmalade. I'm not thinking of the chemistry that might be useful in healing certain ailments. So tell us why the Italian blackberry is potentially a good source for drugs. So as an ethnobotanist, um, part of my job involves interviewing people about their medical traditions. And the elm leaf blackberry or Rubus ulmifolius, which is commonly found across the Mediterranean, was one of those plants that really caught my attention. Um, Different people reported during their interviews that whenever they were dealing with healing like a skin abscess or an ingrown hair or some sort of skin infection, that they would often cover that with the fresh leaves of this species. So we brought those leaves and also other parts of the plant that were reported for use back to the lab and indeed found that while these plant compounds did not inhibit the growth of these skin bacteria, what they did do is they prohibited um, their ability to form communities. Bacteria love to form communities because they're stronger together. And these communities are made of slimy, kind of sugary matrices that they can embed themselves in And when they're in those communities, it's much more difficult for your immune system to reach the cells and also for antibiotics to reach the cells. But why would the leaves of the Italian blackberry have this property to protect human skin? Well, that's a great question. Um, We have to remember that plants are also susceptible to a number of different bacterial or um, fungal um, pathogens that can actually infect Um, the plants. So while we found the activity in the leaves, we found even more activity in the roots. And if you think about where roots are in the soil, it's, you know, the soil is not sterile. It's, It's populated with a number of many different microbes, most of which are harmless and can actually Um, perhaps interact with plants in a positive way, but there are some that have the potential to cause harm. And so what's interesting that we're finding is that in some cases, these plant compounds are being produced and released not to sterilize the soil or their environment, but to limit the ability of these pathogens from causing harm to the plant by forming these communities on the roots or on other parts. Cassandra, you said as an ethnobotanist, you have collected stories of using plants for traditional healing. But it sounds like what you're doing is that's the first line of research. And then you're taking those plants and coming back to the lab and testing them in a laboratory. So in the field, we're collecting evidence and reports from a number of different people. We take a highly quantitative approach to documenting these um, sets of knowledge about how people use plants for health. We then take that knowledge and apply it in in a scientific laboratory. And in the laboratory, we are extracting chemicals from these plants. We are testing them in different biological models to try to understand if and how these plant chemicals might actually be working in a medical context. Well, let's find out what some of these medicinal properties are up against. So in some ways, the poster child right now for antibiotic resistance is the Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, and it's um, it's been found in hospitals, but now outside of hospitals. Now, what makes MRSA so effective in attacking healthy cells? MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, refers to a kind of staph infection that is drug resistant. In fact, in many cases, these MRSA are not just resistant to methicillin, but a suite of other antibiotics. 
So in, in methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, there are two general categories of this bacteria. We have the community-associated strains and the healthcare-associated strains. In the community, this particular kind of MRSA is very good at releasing a lot of nasty toxins that can quickly cause severe infection and disease in even very healthy individuals. Healthcare associated MRSA, on the other hand, is um, found more in patients that are in the hospital or are already sick or undergoing surgery. And those tend to be more chronic and depend on that aggregation of bacteria in the body. So which plant do you use, Cassandra, to fight against this nasty toxin that MRSA produces? So right now we're working on a chestnut tree extract. And this was used in traditional medicine for skin inflammations. And we indeed we've found that chemicals in the in the leaves of this plant are able to interrupt the ability of bacteria to talk to one another. So if we turn off their ability to sense each other, they're not going to make toxins because they really don't recognize that they have a large community of peers around them. So they're behaving like a single cell, even though they're surrounded by many others because so they, they think, just can't see them. They think they're yeah. isolated now and Absolutely. they don't know what to do. Well, you have a personal motivation in fighting this nasty bacteria, MRSA. You first encountered it, I believe, when you were quite young. What happened? Yeah, so I was I was actually quite fortunate that I had an, an MSSA infection or a, a methicillin sensitive. So this is really before resistance came on the scene for methicillin. But I had an amputation of my right leg due to a number of birth defects that I had of my skeletal system. And following the amputation, I got a severe hospital-acquired infection in my bone tissue and in the soft tissues where my leg had been cut off. The bacteria actually got into the bone and um, the tissue became infected basically with gangrene and had to be um, further cut back. So I'm actually very fortunate that they were still able to save my knee. Even though this infection though, this is something important to note, even though this infection was treatable by antibiotics, it was susceptible, the fact that it was in my bone this is something that happens with biofilm infections of staph in the body. This is the same concept that affects people that have medical implants like hip replacements or knee replacements. When the bacteria form that community in the body, either in the bone or on the heart tissue or on top of these devices, they're almost impossible to get rid of. And this is why they had to actually go back and cut out that bone. This is why when patients have an infected knee implant or hip replacement that's infected, they often have to go in and remove that replacement. So it's not just antibiotic resistance that's important, but also this idea of intrinsic resistance or the ability of bacteria to become stronger by grouping together in something called a biofilm. Then you went on to dedicate your life to helping save lives through looking for new drugs. So it must feel personal in, on one level. Yeah, well, you know, as I like to say, <laughs> because of my work in Italy, I call this my vendetta. <laughs> so yes, I, I am personally motivated to address this problem. I think that this is the problem of, of modern medicine. If we can't come up with better solutions to dealing with antibiotic resistance, you know, we're really in a lot of trouble. All of modern medicine is in many ways reliant on our ability to prevent infectious processes in the body, be it through, you know, cancer therapy or childbirth or routine surgery. This will have a huge impact across the board. Cassandra Quave, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Cassandra Quave is an ethnobotanist and assistant professor of dermatology at Emory University and curator of its herbarium. Traditionally, we have turned to plants for medicine, and we heard from her specifically how plants can attack the toxins produced by bacteria. So we end this show with toxins, but we began it with venoms. Well, obviously the venoms are different because they're deliberately injected, not by plants, but by animals. And there are a lot of animals that use venoms, and they're very clever about it. After a couple of hundred million years of evolution, they're clever in the sense that they attack the two most vulnerable parts of a body that'll work fast, you know, your nervous system, your circulatory system. And the fact that they attack those systems means, hey, 
we've got a lot of health problems with our circulatory and nervous systems. Maybe these very finely tuned chemicals can be of use to us. The other thing that came through in the show is that these animals that are venomous, they don't necessarily pose a threat to us. Yeah, but I'm still going to check my shoes in the morning in case there are any scorpions in there. We want to thank Owen Merricks and all his scaly friends here at the East Bay Vivarium in Berkeley, California. We also want to thank the scale List duo who help us produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky-David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And home to the Carl Sagan Center, a multidisciplinary research institution. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the episode Venom Diagram. I'm Molly Bentley. I'm Seth Shostak. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find lots of episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because the ether just knocks you out, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, well, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you listen to our show via iTunes, we invite you to leave a review on our iTunes page. To reach us directly with your comments, throw in some faint praise, that always helps, then email it all to bigpicturescience at SETI.org. I'm just going to check in with the fate of the mice over here. Oh, I think it might be unfortunate. No sign of the mouse. Unless he's that bump in the middle of that python. Yeah, there could be that bulge there. Then again, it could be just middle-aged spread. <laughs>